personal favorite poll. To my channel. Um, we're in a different location today uh, and that is because I am at my pole studio. As some of you may know, I've recently opened my very own pole studio. It's called Elevate Fitness Studio and that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. A little while ago, I uploaded a shorts video of the whole pole studio setup with our poles and I'll insert some clips now so that you can see, but we basically got these blue powder coated poles that are up in the studio. And someone commented on that and asked why we didn't do copper poles because they thought it would look really good with our branding and our setup and everything to have like a copper colored pole. And I do agree it would look beautiful, but there is a very specific reason we can't use copper poles. We went with the standard powder coated pole. And if you have no idea what the difference between those two might be, then this is a video for you because that comment and the back and forth that I had with the commenter, they were really nice about it when I like explained why we didn't have copper poles. But anyway, that whole back and forth made me realize that a lot of people might not know about the specifics of what a pole dancing pole entails because it can't just be any old metal pole. There are actually some pretty like detailed specifics to it. So I thought I would make this video summing up kind of why we chose the poles we did for our studio and also just giving kind of my thoughts and perspectives and some information on all the different types of poles that are available out there. So in case you are thinking of setting up your own home studio and getting a pole for yourself to train at home, or if you want to know more about the poles that you use at your own pole studio, if you are a pole studio owner, or if you want to um, know about the poles on that at your studio that you train at, if you just train and you don't own a studio. I thought this would be a nice place to get kind of all the information about pole dancing poles in one place so that everyone can learn a little bit about what goes into it. In addition to this video, I am also going to be putting up a blog post on our studio website. It's elevatefitnessstudio.co.za will be under the blogs section. So in case you need to refer to a written version of this video, it'll be up there for you. And I'll put the link to that in the description of this video as well. So let's jump straight into the different types of poles out there. The first thing that you need to consider when you are deciding on a pole is about the permanency and portability of the pole that you want to get. There are a number of different choices in terms of how permanent versus portable your pole can get and which one you're going for is going to very much depend on the purposes that you are using it for. For us, when we were setting up Elevate Fitness Studio, we knew that we wanted permanent poles that were going to be up the whole time, not um, they didn't need to be taken up and down. We didn't want that hassle of before and after classes having to install and remove poles. So we wanted permanent fixed poles. However, you do get poles that are a lot less permanent that you can take up and down more easily and poles that you can even transport around and take around with you like stage poles, which is the first type of pole we'll talk about. So this is going to be your most portable least permanent option of a pole. And a stage pole is kind of as the name suggests, a pole that is on a stage. So you have a round circular base to the pole. Oftentimes it'll have some spokes coming off to help give it a little bit more stability and balance and your pole will be in the center. A lot of times the stage itself can be disassembled into smaller pieces and the pole can be removed and inserted into the stage as needed. This pole will not be attached at the top to anything. So it's attached to the stage at the bottom of the floor, but it's not attached to anything, any sort of ceiling or anything. So these poles are great, for example, if you want to be able to use them outside, because obviously you don't need a ceiling to be able to install them. In terms of some of the drawbacks of a stage pole is that they can be quite tedious to actually set up. There's usually a lot of working components um, and a lot that has to be assembled each time you want to use it, if you are packing it away after every time you do use it and traveling around with it. It also, because it is not attached to the ceiling, can feel a little bit wobbly if you're doing really advanced uh, dynamic tricks and if you're working very close to the top of the pole. And there is also a limit to how high a stage pole can safely go because, again, it's not attached to the top and you don't want it to get too top heavy that it will actually tip over, which is, again, why some stages will have those spokes so that they can go a little bit higher, but there is still a 
physical limit because of physics that you can't go too high and you want to kind of be careful with some of the more advanced high level dynamic tricks that you're doing so that you don't tip your stage pole over and also so that it doesn't feel too wobbly but that being said there is really nothing that beats the portability of a stage pole and that is why people get stage poles despite some of the drawbacks so for example i know some instructors pole instructors who do a lot of bachelorette parties they might use stage pole because they can travel with the stage pole to different bachelorette parties and they're not constrained to only host in one location um traveling instructors who do other things other than bachelorette parties might also do this as well or use stage poles for that purposes if you are a like student and you're getting the pole for yourself, you might choose a stage pole because you don't have a ceiling that you can easily mount a pole onto and therefore it not being attached at the ceiling is helpful. Or maybe you only have space for a pole outside and then you can set up your stage pole outside and not, be have, to, not have to worry about again mounting it into a ceiling. So those are some of the reasons why a person would choose a stage pole even though it does have some slight drawbacks in certain aspects. The next pole that we'll talk about is what's called a pressure mounted pole. Now these poles are slightly less portable than your stage pole would be because they do need a ceiling to be pressure mounted into. However, they are still a little bit more portable and a little bit less permanent than some of the other options that we'll discuss because they can be taken up and down fairly easily. So, as the name suggests, a pressure mounted pole is held in place due to the pressure going into the floor and into the ceiling. The pole has a usually a twisting mechanism and quite a wide base for the ceiling that allows you to twist it up, expanding the height of the pole and pressurizing it into both the floor and the ceiling. The benefits of a pressure mounted pole would be that it is fairly easy to put a pressure mounted pole up and down. You can take it down pretty quickly and you can put it up pretty quickly. So it means it adds that little bit extra versatility to the pole. You don't have to have it up in your space the whole time. These are very popular amongst home polers for that reason because they don't have to have a pole up in their house all the time. They can put it up for training and take it down when they are done training. And it's not too long a process to set it up and take it back down again. Pressure mounted poles are also usually the most inexpensive option to go with, again making them really popular for home polers who don't want to invest a huge amount of money into their pole but still want to get something that's going to be safe and good quality. In terms of the drawbacks of a pressure mounted pole, you do have to have a very specific ceiling in order for a pressure mounted pole to work. If you have ceiling boards and not an actual proper ceiling, you are not going to be able to mount a pressure mounted pole up on your ceiling because the pressure will just push the ceiling boards up. So you need to have something that is relatively stable in terms of your ceiling. There are options if you get a professional installer who can help reinforce your ceiling if it's not quite strong enough for a pressure mounted pole so that you will be able to put one up. However, this does increase the cost slightly because you're having to pay for professional insulation. And one of the benefits of a pressure mounted pole is that it often doesn't require that professional insulation if you do have a stable and strong ceiling already in place. Another thing to be aware of with the pressure mounted poles is because they are pressure mounted, they do work best at slightly shorter heights. This again makes them more ideal for home use than for studio use necessarily, where the ceiling heights might be a little bit taller. And you generally won't find any competitions using a pressure mounted pole system just because you are quite limited to the height. Um, if the pole is too long, you might start to get some bowing because of the extra length of the pole and the slight instability that the pressure mounting might cause at greater heights. Usually pressure mounted poles will range from about two, just over two meters to about 2.5, 2.6 meters. You don't generally see pressure mounted poles much higher than that. I've never seen, for example, a three meter tall pressure mounted pole because that might get dangerous if you again are trying to throw dynamic tricks um, that it might rip the pole out of place. That being said, a lot of those pole fail videos that you see where people kind of swing off the pole and the pole comes flying um, with them, those often are with pressure mounted poles. If you look, you'll be able to see that the poles are pressure mounted, they're not bolted into the ceiling. And partly this might come from user error with installation, that they just haven't tightened the pole enough and that there's not quite enough pressure to keep it in place. 
or the person might have installed the property but the pole is just not strong enough to withstand extreme extreme dynamic tricks so often you'll see that these sort of fails happen with really um, strong static spins where you're putting a lot of force and a lot of momentum onto the pole and the pole just can't withstand that but most of the time if the pole is a short enough height um, and if it has been uh, tightened properly enough so that there's enough pressure into both the floor and the ceiling that shouldn't be an issue so if you do get a pressure mounted pole make sure you're tightening it up enough every single time one final thing to mention with pressure mounted poles is that you can also get slight variations on the pressure mounted poles so you get options where instead of it just being a wide base plate that is pressured onto the ceiling at the top of the pole you get um mechanisms that are able to be bolted into the ceiling that the pole then attaches to and screws into providing a bit of a pressure system and then also the extra security of having a screw mechanism that also is helping to hold the pole in place those are going to be a little bit more stable again because of those that screwing mechanism you'll be able to throw more dynamic tricks on them without having to worry quite as much about the pole potentially slipping out of place from the ceiling the next type of pole that we'll talk about, which is slightly more permanent than a pressure mounted pole, is a stowaway pole. Now these are a relatively new introduction into the pole market, and I haven't really seen them for home use, but they are very, very useful in a studio space that might not be being used as a pole studio the whole time. So these poles are fixed and attached at the ceiling but they can be unscrewed or unattached at the bottom and then are able to be lifted up and stored away flat in the ceiling. So you can have an open floor space when you need it and then bring the poles down when you want them as well without necessarily having to worry about uh, taking pressure mounted poles up and down every single time you want a class. It's much easier to just simply let the poles swing down and then attach it, secure it to the floor. Um, this again is really beneficial for studios that have shared space or they perform classes, they have classes where they need open floor space at times so they have other sorts of dance classes and not just pole because putting up and down six or eight or ten pressure mounted poles before every single pole class can be quite tedious and stowaway poles are supposed to take away some of that effort and some of that work making it a lot easier to transition from open floor space to a pole studio. Now, the drawbacks of this stowaway system is that they can be very expensive and they do require specialist installation. This is a game where you're not really gonna see them in a home setting and are much more likely to see them in a studio setting because you can't even find prices online for these sorts of pole systems. You need a custom coach, you need a professional rigger to come in, assess your space, see what uh, solutions need to be put into the ceiling, if any, and see how the stowaway system is going to work in that. Space. It's not something that is really going to be necessary at the home setting and it's probably going to be far too expensive for most home polers anyway. And finally, the most permanent option for a pole is a permanent or bolted in pole. So these poles will be installed once and they stay up permanently. There's no taking them up and taking them down. They will usually be bolted into the ceiling and potentially bolted into the floor as well. With these sorts of poles, they are obviously, again, going to be most common in a studio setting. You're less likely to see them in a home setting. Some home polers might have a permanent pole set up, especially if they own their house and aren't renting. But a lot of places, people might be renting, they aren't necessarily able to install a permanent pole fixture into it that would be bolted into the floor and the ceiling. So they'd rather go for one of the other options, like a stage pole or a pressure mounted pole. But in a lot of studios where the studio is just a pole space and there's no sharing of space, no need for the poles to be taken up and down, you will find these permanent bolted in poles. Now, these poles theoretically can be taken up and down, but it is quite a lot of effort to take them up and down and generally does require a someone who has a lot of experience and knows what they're doing to be able to take them up and down, to unbolt them from the ceiling, unbolt them from the floor and do the whole set up. The benefit of these types of poles is that they can be a lot more stable than your stage poles, than your pressure mounted poles, and therefore you can generally get a lot more height. 
Most competitions will do a version of a like bolted in permanent pole, except they won't do it as a like fully permanent pole. They'll usually use a truss system. The pole will then be set up, bolted into the truss at the top, potentially bolted and secured in some way into the floor at the bottom, so that you can have these heights of three or four meters and have people be able to throw really dynamic tricks on them without worrying about the pole slipping out like it could potentially do with a pressure mounted pole. This permanent sort of bolted in pole fixture is ultimately what we decided to go with at Elevate Fitness Studio because we don't need to be taking our poles up and down. We have two separate studio spaces, one that is just for pole and the other that we use as more of an open studio space and where we have our aerial hammocks that we are able to take up and down. So we do not need to worry about being able to stow our poles away um, or needing to take them up and down in between classes. So we went with this permanent pole fixture. We got a professional um, rigger and installer to come set them up for us and they are in place and we are pretty much never gonna take them down. That's a basic summary of all the different kind of installation types for poles. But once you've got your installation type sorted and you know which broad type of pole you're getting and how it's going to be installed, there are still a few other things to consider. One of those things is the decision of whether you're going to get a spinning pole, a static pole, or both. It used to be way more common to have to choose between those three options in the past. Uh, with some of the very first poles, there was only the option to have it static or spinning, and there was no option to have both. However, because the industry has developed and new technology has emerged, these days most poles generally come with the option to be both spinning and static. There are very few that have only the option to be static or only the option to be spinning. But generally, if you do find those options, they do seem to be slightly cheaper because there's slightly less engineering involved. You don't have to have that additional mechanism that allows it to change between the two options. Obviously for us at Innovate Fitness Studio, it was a no brainer that we definitely wanted to have poles that were able to do both static and spinning because we teach classes on both static and spinning. So that is what we needed for the studio. But like I said, anyway, most poles are gonna have come with this option to do both. The more important decision these days is actually comes down to what type of locking mechanism you're going to have to change the pole from static to spinning. There are a couple of different options that you can go with here. The three kind of most common options are some sort of pin or bolt mechanism where you either push a pin in and out or a bolt in and out to the bottom of the pole that changes it from spinning to static. You also have the Allen key option. A lot of X poles have this option where you get a little Allen key, you unscrew your Allen keys or your little um, bolts and that changes it from spinning to static. And then finally, you also have X poles twist and lock mechanism. I don't think I've seen any other brands that have quite the same mechanism as x -Pole. It's a really, really smooth and convenient option, but essentially you pull up a little bottom piece of the pole, twist it around to change it from static to spinning. Now, x -Pole's twist and lock mechanism is definitely the best mechanism that I've come across, and it is so smooth and simple and easy to use. I actually really love it for poles. However, you have to buy an x -Pole, and in South Africa that means you have to import an x -Pole, and generally these poles are quite expensive, particularly the ones with that twist and lock mechanism. The other option is to do, again, the Allen key or the bolt. The drawbacks of an Allen key is that it is quite time consuming, just slightly more time consuming to put it on and off static and spinning and it is a little bit more complicated for students. You can, if you do the, uh, put it onto static wrong with the Allen key, you can actually damage your pole. I have done this once before where we had an X pole at our house when, we, when I first started training and I didn't know quite how to put it onto static. Um, my mom and I, we, used, we shared the pole, we used it together and she was usually the one that put it from static to spinning and spinning to static. But I was home one day and needed to change the pole and I accidentally tightened the Allen keys in the wrong position and it actually damaged the inside of the pole. So that is definitely a drawback, especially in a studio setting where students might be coming in for the first time and they might not know how exactly to put the pole onto spinning and static. So if you're an instructor or a studio owner and you don't want your poles to get damaged, you're either gonna have to give really detailed step-by-step -step instructions to your students or you're gonna have to put it onto spinning and static yourself. This means that for most studio settings, uh, some sort of bolt option is going to be more 
uh, efficient and a lot easier. The drawbacks of the bolt option is that it's a lot easier for the pole to accidentally pop from one uh, mode to another. So it can accidentally pop from static to spinning because the bolt is not quite as secure as an Allen key. But despite this kind of drawback, this is ultimately the, the method that we decided to use to put our poles onto static and spinning is we have a little bolt that you push through from one side of the bottom of the pole to the other that locks it and unlocks it. And again, the main reason for that was just ease of use. We want our students to be able to put our poles from static onto spinning and from spinning onto static fairly easily. And you also don't have to worry about losing Allen keys or always having an Allen key around. So the next factor that you want to consider when you are getting a pole is what diameter of pole to get. The standard diameters that are generally available are 40 millimeters, 42 millimeters, or 45 millimeters. Obviously, if you're getting your pole custom made, like we, for example, got our poles for our studio custom made, you can have a little bit more flexibility on how choosing these diameters. But generally, if you're ordering a pole from an external company or website, you are going to be served one of those three standard diameters. A couple of years ago, it was far more common to see 45 millimeters and 50 millimeter poles. When I first started training at uh, one of the studios, we had what we called the fatties, which were the big 50 millimeter poles. But these days, you very rarely see those 50 millimeter poles anymore. And even the 45 millimeters are coming, uh, becoming a little bit less common. So in terms of the benefits and drawbacks of these different diameters, some people, especially people with smaller hands, are going to prefer the 40 millimeters and the 42 millimeters. You're gonna find it easier for hand grip, especially again, if you do have those smaller hands. But a lot of people also do find that the 40 and 42 millimeters pinch a little bit more on the legs and aren't quite as easy for anything that does involve leg grip. With the 45 millimeter, some people on occasion may struggle with their hand grip on the 45 millimeter, especially when it comes to more advanced tricks that might be like one arm hands or where you're really very dependent on your hand grip. But generally people do find that 45 millimeters are a lot better for the leg grip. So things like sits, thigh holds, that sort of thing are going to knee hooks even are gonna be a little bit easier on the 45 millimeter. We ultimately decided to go with the 45 millimeter poles because that is competition standard. So if any of our students ever want to compete and for us when we're training at the studio, it's going to be the most similar and the most transferable because of that 45 millimeter being the most common that you do see at competitions. Some competitions obviously might have different diameters. There are some competitions that do use 42 millimeters, but generally for us, the 45 millimeter seems to be the most kind of perfect sweet spot in terms of it's not actually too bad on the hands, it's not as bad as a 50 millimeter pole where you feel like you can't grip at all, but it's not as bad for the legs as a 40 millimeter or 42 millimeter pole. And finally, we arrive at what arguably is the most important thing to consider when you are choosing your pole, which is the finish of the pole or the material that it is made out of. Now, there are a couple of different options to choose from here. You get chrome, stainless steel, powder coated, brass, and silicone as kind of the main five. So let's run through them, starting with stainless steel. So stainless steel is kind of like the OG for poles. A lot of the older poles, those 50 millimeter ones, would have been stainless steel poles. The drawback of them is that they can be very slippery. Um, a lot of people, when they try a stainless steel pole, are not gonna enjoy it too much because they find it very slippery on the skin and on the hand grip. Some people do like and enjoy the stainless steel and they don't mind the feeling of it, but generally most people are gonna prefer one of the other finishes. These days, it is pretty rare to find stainless steel poles in studios, at least it is in South Africa. And if there does happen to be a stainless, pole, stainless steel pole in a studio, it will usually be the one that's like shunned as the pole of last resort. Everyone will be fighting to avoid it because like I said, again, generally people find them to be too slippery. The one upside of a stainless steel pole is that they generally are pretty durable and will last a long time. There are stainless steel poles from like 10 years ago that are still perfect good to use today. The next pole that we'll talk about is a chrome pole. So generally people find chrome poles to be a little bit more grippy than a stainless steel pole and chrome poles have generally seemed to replace stainless steel poles in a lot of places. 
Chrome polls tend to be pretty popular overseas and you do see them used fairly often in competitions, especially overseas competitions. However, they're actually not super popular here in South Africa. Only a handful of studio studios have Chrome polls and even the studios that do have Chrome polls might only have one or two. And probably one of the main reasons why Chrome polls aren't super popular in South Africa is because they are generally known to work pretty well in colder climates and they don't really work that well for people who sweat a lot. So in a hot place like South Africa, Chrome polls don't really work too well other than in our winter. Another drawback of Chrome polls is that the Chrome coating does contain zinc and therefore they're not going to be suitable for people who do have those allergies to zinc. The next material we'll talk about is brass and this is my personal favorite pole. This is the one that's also used at all IPSF competitions um, and it is used at a couple of other competitions I do believe but I find personally that brass gives the perfect balance between not too grippy yet not too slippery. So I find that brass poles are great for me to do things like drops but also not kind of suffer too much in hand and skin grip. Brass poles work best in slightly humid environments and if the air or your skin is too dry you might find yourself slipping a lot on a brass pole. However, this can usually be overcome with grip aids or the use of something like a shaving cream. Next up, we'll talk about powder coated poles. Now, powder coated poles are pretty much the industry standard in South Africa. A lot of places overseas don't really use powder coated as much. They more tend towards the brass. I know brass is very popular in Australia or the chrome, which is a lot more popular in Europe. But in South Africa, the vast majority of studios, most of their poles, the majority of their poles will be powder coated poles. Powder coated poles are great for hand grip. A lot of people will find powder coated poles to be a lot more grippy than brass, stainless steel or chrome. Um, and as such, people feel like they can get a lot more confident with their tricks and especially their hand grip on a powder coated pole. However, the drawback of a powder coated pole is sometimes the grip is just a little bit too much and sometimes people might struggle with things like drops on a powder coated pole. It is possible to do drops on a powder coated pole, it just is generally quite a bit more painful than on, for example, a brass or a chrome pole. And some people find that um, their wrists get quite easily burned in a static spin, for example, on a powder coated pole. And then the last pole finish that we will talk about is a silicone pole. So generally a silicone pole is a pole that has a silicone coating or silicone wrap on top. And this silicone wrap provides a lot of grip. In fact, silicone poles provide so much grip that you don't have to wear your usual pole outfit of shorts and a crop top. You can pole on a silicone pole fully clothed in leggings and a long sleeve top. That is how much grip the silicone provides. So for people who really struggle with grip on the pole, they might enjoy a silicone pole because they are able to grip a lot more easily. However, in my opinion, silicone poles do come with a lot of drawbacks. Silicone poles, the grip is so extreme to the extent that it can actually be quite painful to pole on a silicone pole, even when you are fully clothed. I've been training on a flying pole recently that is coated in silicone, and I have found it excruciating to get used to. I've had to build up my tolerance for pain pretty much from scratch again, because the silicone is just that much more painful than even a powder coated pole. Additionally, there are just some moves that you're really not going to be able to do to their full extent on a silicone pole. So for example, static spins are really not going to be great on a silicone pole. Um, you're really going to struggle with them. Your hand is going to feel like it can't move at all. So you're going to be pretty limited to pretty much only doing spinning moves on a silicone pole, which is why the silicone works great for flying pole, for example, because it's not attached to the floor at all, so you can just spin around the whole time. Ultimately, at Elevate Fitness Studio, we decided to go with powder coated poles for all six of our poles here, and this is because even though brass is my personal favorite, and I would love it if we had six brass poles, we find that powder coated poles are really great for beginner. They are generally the industry standard here in South Africa, so if people are coming from other studios, it's probably what they're going to be used to and we wanted all six of our poles to be the same finish we didn't want to have mixed matched poles at the studio 
We could potentially have gone with all brass poles in our studio, however, brass poles are very, very expensive and we would have had to import them into South Africa, which would have added to the cost even more. So ultimately, we decided to go with a slightly cheaper option, but still great option of the powder coated poles. And that is pretty much everything that you need to know about pole dancing poles. So whether you are choosing a pole for yourself to get for your own training, or if you just wanted to know a little bit more about the different types of poles that are out there and what you might be using at your studio, I hope you found this helpful. Please leave me a comment down below saying what your favorite type of pole is. If you train at a studio, what poles does your studio use? And do you enjoy the poles that they use there? And also, what do you think is most common in your country? Because I think that the poles used in countries varies quite a bit. Like I said in this video, powder coated is most common in South Africa, but I do know that it differs from place to place. So let me know what is most popular in your country and what your favorite pole is. Thanks so much for watching this video. Bye.